All right, you're good to go. Hi, my name is Jacob Rich, and welcome to Friedman 8 for this discussion on reclaiming liberalism. Today, I am joined by policy analyst from Reason Foundation, Sati Marar, and the Honorable Aaron Stonehouse, member of the Western Australian Legislative Council for the South Metropolitan Region. And I am also a policy analyst at Reason Foundation, and it's a pleasure to discuss this topic with you guys today. So where do I begin? Uh, you know, my perspective is mostly as an American, because I'm an American, but I know we have a big Aussie audience with us today. So let me try to give you guys a little bit of perspective. Uh, when most Americans think of liberalism, they consider it an idea of the left while putting conservatism on the right. But if you review the definitions of these words, you'll notice they are not on the same spectrum. Conservatism simply means to preserve the status quo, and liberalism simply means just freedom. However, dictionaries would describe liberalism as literally the opposite of conservatism. What's odd is that this confusion is mostly reserved to the United States, as most of the people watching understand, Australia actually puts liberal, the liberal party on the right, and most other countries in general equate libertarianism to liberalism. If you're in South America and you say liberal, they basically think of the idea of what libertarianism is in the United States. So, I think one way to go about this is actually to discuss the etymology of the word. And I was discuss with this big dictionary I got to read you guys what liberalism means in this big Webster dictionary. It says, according to this massive dictionary, a political and moral philosophy, liberalism is based on liberty, the consent of the governed and equality before the law. Liberals generally support free markets, free trade, and limited government, yada, 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 basically exactly how we describe libertarianism. So why is there such this giant divide in the United States over what libertarianism is and what liberalism is? Why, when we discuss liberalism in the United States and you say you're a liberal, they automatically think you want to raise taxes and input a whole bunch of government control? Well, uh, the, the if you, if you think about this, you actually have to think about like the war of words that's been happening for a very long time. So the idea of liberalism actually started with the Greeks and Judaism. And through Christianity and the writing of the New Testament, uh, these ideas of liberalism uh, actually started to develop. And then they were kind of put together under uh, John Locke, who then uh, basically wrote the ideas of what sort of rights are inalienable to humans. Um, when John Locke first wrote it, he said that women, I'm sorry, that, well, men and women um, were definitely in need or that basically he said that we all have life, liberty, and property. And then a century later, Thomas Jefferson came in and he said that we have life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And Thomas Jefferson described those as inalienable rights. The reason why he suggested that we replace property with uh, the pursuit of happiness is because property is not actually inalienable. It is something that can be taken and seized and transferred. But life and liberty, those are not things that you can actually take from someone else. And the pursuit of happiness is also something that cannot be transferred. So basically, these ideas of liberalism um, were very prominent throughout the United States. Uh, obviously, the United States wrestled with uh, racism and slavery, which was absolutely terrible. But in general, the idea of government intrusion was very limited. Taxes were always low. The size of the federal government relative to all GDP and all other sorts of governments was actually quite low. Uh, state governments and local governments at the time actually had much larger sized governments. This was all true until the Wilsonian era. And Wilson actually wrote a little passage that I need to find. But basically, he is the one who redefined liberalism in the United States. He wrote a little passage or a little essay called Meaning of a Liberal Education. And it's probably the least liberal thing I've ever heard in my life. Where he says, we want one class of persons to have a liberal education, and we want another class of persons, a very larger class, necessity in every society, to forego the privilege of a liberal education and fit themselves to perform specific difficult manual tasks. 
So he was actually describing what we know now as uh, progressivism. And this actually started a war of words for about 50 years in the United States. And this war of words continued until about 1955, when a man named Ridley, who was known as a libertarian, but also called himself a liberal, um, wrote this passage. And this passage is actually what predicated the libertarian movement in the United States. He said, many of us call ourselves liberals. And it is true that the word liberal once described persons who respected the individual and feared the use of mass compulsions. But the leftists have now corrupted that once proud term to identify themselves and their program of more government ownership of property and more controls over persons. As a result, those who believe in freedom must explain that when we call ourselves liberals, we mean liberals in the uncorrupted classical sense. At best, this is awkward and subject to misunderstanding. Here's a, a suggestion. Let those of us who love liberty trademark and reserve for our own use the good, honorable word libertarian. Well, the word libertarian actually started in the 1700s, but really did not have much of a use in modern language until this passage was written. And what really put the nail in the coffin for this was when Buckley, William F. Buckley, wrote, when he wrote uh, Up From Liberalism, and the, that was basically the, po the book that put William F. Buckley on the map. It kind of defined the intellectual conservatism for the United States, which is still used through the National Review. And he basically just completely equated progressivism and liberalism in that book. And that type of mindset has really predicated the United States ever since. So when thinking about why we should really reclaim the word liberal. I, I, I think about two books. I think about George Orwell's 1984, and I think of Huxley's Brave New World. Both of them having a little bit different ideas of what a dystopia would look like, but I think when you combine them together, you get something that's very similar towards what we're going, I'm sorry, that's very similar to, to what we're going towards right now. Um, so if you guys recall George Orwell, he actually spoke a lot about um, language. He said, don't you see that the aim of Newspeak, Newspeak being the new language to replace English in 1984, don't you see that the whole aim of Newspeak is to narrow the range of thought? In the end, we shall make thought crime literally impossible because there will be no words to express it. I, I think of like how there's so many nonsense words in 1984. And when people are saying liberal today, they, they don't actually have any sort of concrete meaning for it. It at best means leftism, but there really isn't any sort of consistent way to apply the word. If you say liberalize guns, that can only be interpreted as more freedom for guns, liberalize taxes, less taxes, liberalize uh, marriage, gay marriage. But if you say liberal, um, other than get the gay marriage example, everything else is the exact opposite. It's, there's no real consistent use of this word. And because of the polling of what words are, uh, because of the approval ratings of different types of ideology, Republican, Democrat, those hover around anywhere between 40 and 60%, just depending on who's in power. Uh, right now, there's a lot of polls showing that Biden's ahead, but if you look at the approval for Republicans in general versus Democrats, you'll see that the Republicans actually just overtip the Democrats in the uh, Gallup poll. So everyone look out for that. Uh, Dems always seem to think they're gonna win when they don't. Um, where was I going with that? Oh yeah, um, but if you see the polling on approval of libertarianism, people don't really like it. And I think it's because of the etymology of the word. Like the word is actually, like an advocacy word. Like if you think of like vegetarian, authoritarian, totalitarian, like all these words that end in tarian. It's like these, you're advocating for these things when the idea of liberalism and freedom is like, we don't need to tell anybody what to do. Um, I'm kind of tempted to grab that big dictionary and read the exact definition of libertarianism, but it's really, it's really all it's gonna say is that it's just an advocate for liberty. And I think liberalism is something that we should be able to condone without necessarily being advocates. I'm proud to be an advocate for liberalism. I'm 
and a proud to be an advocate for freedom. But the idea that we should expect every single person who has our views to be an advocate, I think is absolutely ridiculous. And that is why I think we should really start using the language in the United States of liberalism instead of libertarianism. And since the rest of the world is already basically doing that, and Australia has, Australia has already put liberal on the right side of the political spectrum, I think it would actually be easier to change the language back to its original meanings in the United States versus trying to get the rest of the world to accept this new ridiculous word called libertarianism. So uh, that's my introduction. And next we have speaking. Um, I'm not quite sure. Does uh, Aaron or Satya, or which one of you guys are going to go next? I'll, I'll go next. Satya? All right, great. Uh, Satya Marar is a policy analyst with me at Reason Foundation. He focuses on education policy. I'm sure many of you guys know him. So go, carry on. Yeah, sure. So, you know, I'd like you to picture for me a round table. And there's four people sitting around this round table, right? There's a Catholic priest, there's a sex worker. Um, there's a conservative businessman, and there's a member of the Black Panther Party who's carrying an AR-15. Uh, this is not the setup to a bad joke, um, but the question is, how do you get these four people who would never be seen together at a bar having a drink? What set of principles can you put to them that would actually bring them to some sort of mutual goodwill and understanding between each other? Well, you might say that while the conservative businessman, and this is an American for the purpose of the example, uh, while he might not agree at all with the politics of the Black Panther Party, uh, he can understand that if he is going to have the right to defend his property uh, from any intruders or people who are gonna break into it or attack his business using his gun, then that right should automatically therefore extend to anyone else who wants to defend their community or their family using their guns, like, like what the Black Panther Party uh, did. Um, and, and, and as long as they can both agree not to aggress against each other or to aggress against anyone else, uh, they should both be able to come to fairly firm consensus that allows them both to coexist peacefully. Uh, similarly, you know, while the priest might not approve of the lifestyle of the sex worker and might find it to be sinful, uh, the priest can certainly at least accept that for this person to be, uh, you know, arrested by the cops and thrown into jail for a long period of time or fined very heavily might make their life a lot more difficult and might end up, you know, perpetuating the abuse that they've suffered due to their lifestyle or as part, rather not due to, I mean, or as part of their lifestyle. Um, and and um, all four of them can at least, you know, in theory be made to agree on the fact that while they don't agree with each other's politics, the fact that they're able to discuss and exchange views with each other and come to some understanding to open dialogue is in fact a good thing. And that's why it's so important for us to reclaim liberalism because in a plural, pluralistic society, like the one that we live in, it really is the only recipe to restore some sort of social cohesion and tolerance. So just because the people on the other side of the fence seem to be getting more unhinged and rabid, doesn't mean you throw the baby out with the bathwater and get rid of the principles that made our unity as a civilization even possible uh, in the first place. Um, and the reason why I bring this up is this, because the threats to liberalism, contrary to what the media might have you believe today, they don't in fact come just, or primarily even, from you know the, uh, postmodern neo-Marxists, as a certain Canadian professor might call them on the left, or from the national conservatives on the right who hate immigration and you know, love protectionism. Uh, no, the biggest threats to liberalism historically and today come from people who call themselves liberal because they hijack the word when in fact what they really mean is self-interest. They are grifters, nothing more. So when someone like uh, you know uh, uh, Joe Biden, for example, comes out and says, that uh, you know, I've got the support of the teachers union now, I want to uh, get rid of a school voucher program that allowed minority kids to go to a private school of their choice. I'm gonna pull out all these kids from their school. He calls himself a liberal, but that is an actual liberal thing. He'll tell you it's liberal because he thinks that that'll divert money to public schools uh, and therefore kids in public schools benefit, but that isn't liberalism. Um, and uh, it's not just people on the left of politics. What about the debate on so-called religious freedom? I love religious freedom. I think it's awesome that people can practice their religion without interference from the state or from other people. But what's interesting is when you hear some of the strongest advocates for religious freedom, they will sometimes argue for employment protections or protection for contractors who might be let go by an employer who doesn't like the religious views that they express. Now, that's an understandable position. You know, there's, you know, I don't want to see anybody lose their job. I can see where they're coming from. My issue is this, when you ask that same person, 
okay, do you think a gay teacher at a Catholic church should have the protection of the law? Many of them will say, oh, well, actually, no, because freedom of association. So, so you see, this is not a person who actually believes in either the freedom of association or the freedom of uh, disassociation or the freedom of conscience. These are people who believe in, and I'm not applying this term to everyone who talks about religious freedom. There's some very good advocates of religious freedom, including Senator Amanda Stoker up in Queensland, who are consistent morally and in principle. But there are grifters out there who will jump and use liberal language to, to simply shore up what is in fact a self-interest position. And another great example of this is in the US. Um, guess which organization and guess which you know, future American president of the time in the 1960s voted to uh, ban the open carry of guns in the state of California. It was in fact the Reagan administration and it was a National Rifle Association who supported him in doing that. And that law is still on the books. Why did they do that? Because the Black Panther Party staged a peaceful march on the state capitol, carrying their guns, hurting nobody, and because they were doing community patrols of their own neighborhoods to deter police abuse and to deter crime. And that was a little bit too much. So, you know, it, unless we get out there and actually stand up for the actual ideas of liberalism for the sake of liberalism, because we believe in it, it's going to be dominated by self-interested grifters from the left and from the right. Um, and I don't use this term lightly, um, and I have nothing wrong with their self-interest, but you need to understand that when people on either side of politics attack each other, they often attack what they call liberalism. The conservatives attack the left by calling them liberals because the word liberal is now associated with social justice and identity politics. The, uh, the left attack the right. You know, some of them think that Nancy Pelosi is on the right because she's a moderate. Um, and, and call them, accuse them of being liberals rather than being socialists and, and so on. Um, and unless classical liberals, genuine libertarian liberals stand up and take that ground, we're in for a lot of trouble. Um, I would now like to apply this idea to the historical and modern context of Australia, because as Jacob touched upon, we recognize the Liberal Party, at least in theory or in principle, as being on the right side of politics and as believing the idea to be associated with classical liberalism. But the history of liberalism in Australia goes back way further than the Liberal Party. It goes all the way back, in fact, to the 19th century, when, and this might surprise some of you, but liberalism was the, in many ways, the default ideology of Australia for almost the entirety of its founding period. Um, so much so that uh, someone from, you know, complete, completely downtrodden background in the United Kingdom, you know, the riffraff of London, would come here on a convict ship for a very low order offense and make themselves very wealthy through their own hard work and industriousness, whether they were a free settler or they were a free convict. Uh, and you know, the sort of class system you had in the UK due to the land aristocracy didn't quite translate as well. So we had this egalitarian spirit and the spirit of you know, voluntary association to be able to survive in harsh circumstances because the government couldn't be there. And what's more, for most of the 19th century, taxes were very low budgets were balanced and the government's role wasn't uh, that huge. And guess what? That was a period when Australia became per capita, one of the wealthiest countries in the entire world at that time. And the question is then, if, the, if this was a situation in Australia, and if liberalism was so predominant that it didn't need any single party or politician at the time to be the voice of liberalism, because just you were liberal by default, what happened? Well, it all really began to change uh, in the late 19th century. And to this, I have to credit my friend, Zach Goldman, who's a historian, uh, and he works at the Institute of Public Affairs. He wrote a great book, by the way, a biography on uh, Sir Joseph Carruthers, the first premier of New South Wales. I'll talk about him in a bit. Uh, but at the end of the 19th century, we had the gold rush that had just finished. And a gold rush being an artificial high point in the economy when things suddenly get better because there's an influx of activity and, and, and wealth seeking. Uh, but there was a downturn at the end of that. And during times of downturn is usually when the grifters are at their most persuasive and powerful because everyone is fighting for a limited slice of the pie that remains and the demands of the government to quote unquote do something, they tend to go up a lot more when things tend to go south or get bad. So what happened? Well, it all began with self-professed liberals arguing in favor of tariff protection. So all of a sudden, we needed to have a domestic manufacturing industry and apparently the only way we could do that uh, was by placing tariffs on imported goods such as machinery. And so what actually happened? Who benefited from this? Well, I can tell you who got hurt by it. 
Australian agricultural scholars because now they had to pay a premium to import machinery from outside and they couldn't afford it. So they had to pay more to purchase uh, locally made machines. Um, now, uh, I need to add a little bit of a caveat. I mentioned that Australia was quite prosperous at the time. Obviously, it didn't translate to everyone. Uh, the indigenous people were displaced. Uh, there were a lot of clashes that happened and many of them died. Uh, but the predominant ideology, at least amongst the majority of the population, was liberalism. And the second caveat is, at this time, um, there was a lot of attempts by the British uh, to reinvest some of the money from the other colonies, uh, like India, for example, into places like Australia, South Africa, and so on. So, you know, there are caveats to this, absolutely. But, but back to the point. So, at the, around the turn of the 20th century, uh, we now had a situation where there are two forces that were illiberal, but they were being pushed by people who call themselves often liberal. It, it, the, the argument was, look, I'm not against free enterprise. I love free enterprise. I love, you know, markets and all that. I just think the state needs to do a little bit more to take care of, you know, so we can have a manufacturing industry. We just need to nurture it, and then we can all have this free market. Of course, that's a grifter line. Um, and what ended up happening was, oh, and that was, that was one issue. The second issue was, the trade union movement rose and became quite powerful. Uh, they obviously started lobbying for higher wages for workers, which is not a bad thing. But of course, we know that there can be side effects when something like that happens. Uh, goods and services tend to get more expensive and our industries become less competitive relative to the rest of the world. So what did Sir Joseph Carruthers do? A classical liberal premier of New South Wales to get elected in the year 1904. What did he do at a time when the calls were growing to protect local industry and to protect uh, you know, the wages of workers. Well, it was simple. He sold the ideas of liberalism, real classical liberalism to the electorate, and he made it fit into their world. He was unapologetic about the fact that he opposed socialism and he supported individual industry and enterprise. But on top of that, he went and liaised directly with the working class electorates, and he explained to them very simply, do you want the necessities of your life to get cheaper and more affordable? Tea, sugar, whatever it might be. If that's the case, then you know who to vote for. And they did. And he was elected. And to this day, he's one of the most successful premiers of the state of New South Wales. So why do I bring this example up? I bring it up because we haven't learned from our history. And we keep making the same mistakes, even worse than we did in the past. Over the last few decades, we chucked in billions of dollars in subsidy to support a domestic car manufacturing industry because it was our national pride. Billions of dollars that, in theory, uh, could have gone towards even social security net to, to take care of people who really fell on hard times. Uh, money that was taken out of the pockets of hardworking Australians through income tax and so on um, to prop up an industry that ultimately failed anyway. It was corporate welfare. It was corporate handouts. You know, this is the kind of thing that often socialists will refer to as capitalism and capitalists will refer to as socialism when what it actually is, it's cronyism. And that's what the grifters ultimately promote when they say liberal, they promote cronyism. And that's why they are the enemy. So who benefited from those tariffs then if it wasn't the domestic car industry that disappeared anyway? I'll tell you who, number one, the government, uh, and I'll tell you who lost, the ordinary working man, and they still lose today, because guess what? Those tariffs to protect the industry that doesn't exist, they still exist. Because the government is like a heroin addict. It can't get off the good stuff. It needs to buy some more votes. The only people who are its true enemies are genuine liberals. And that's why what we do and what we fight for is so important that we must take it away uh, from the grifters. And today, if you want to buy a Holden car, well, it's manufactured in Mexico, uh, you're going to end up paying a tariff on that car to protect, in, well, it was in theory to protect the company that's now moved overseas. So um, you can see why it is so important for us to fight these battles. And why even in the modern context, we see very similar arguments being made. And sometimes they sound so persuasive. It's amazing. Um, for example, talk about natural gas. About a year ago, electricity was pretty damn expensive. And part of the reason we were told, often by people who call themselves liberal, uh, is that we sell a ton of it to Japan and to other countries. It drives the price up. What? Look, you know, I love the free market. But man, what if we just kept some of that our own resource for ourselves instead of trading on the global market. We drove down prices. We could have a competitive manufacturing industry here by keeping electricity cheap using our own resources. Isn't that a good thing? Well, it sounds lovely on paper. I was almost persuaded by it. The problem is Argentina and Egypt, they both tried doing the same thing. 
And today, Egypt and Argentina both buy natural gas at global prices on the international market because the incentives to actually harvest the stuff out have uh, dried up quite strongly. And investors are, pick, are, you know, are scared because even if a government comes in and says, okay, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna stop this moratorium on exporting the stuff, they don't know if the project they invest billions of dollars in uh, won't be hurt by moratoriums being brought in by the next government that gets elected. The political risk is simply too high. So, you know, the understanding that we need to put across to people who don't necessarily agree with our ideas yet is that we don't fight for these ideas because we believe in the squiggly line and or we believe in these principles and theory. We support them because we know that in the end, they benefit the working man. They benefit the ordinary person, the rich person. You know, in the words of Robert Menzies, the founder of the Liberal Party, you know, we're not the party of the rich person. They're well enough on their own. Even if tax rates were incredibly high, even if protectionism was really high, the rich, the richest people are generally quite fine. They're generally quite well off. They can take care of themselves. They often have their children educated abroad, as they do, as the kids of Venezuela's political elite do. Uh, no, it's for the ordinary person, for the professional class, and for the working man, because the divide between the professional class and the working class now has sort of disappeared a little bit. You know, if you're a plumber, you make as much or more money than an engineer does. So those differences aren't as uh, key as they were in the time of Sir Robert Menzies. Um, we support what we believe in because we know it actually works, and we know that this is the formula for ensuring a successful, strong, and fair society where everyone can have a fair go. Australia, at its very heart, is a liberal country. What we talk about, a fair go. What's in our constitution? So what's in our national anthem? Um, we have boundless plains to share with, and we have gold and soil with wealth for toil, reward for effort. These are liberal principles, and they don't necessarily have the word liberal attached to them. What I'm arguing for is we need to bring that word back front and center. We need to expose the fact that the grifters are not only lying to us by owning the word, but it is absurd for them to even call themselves liberal. So, um, yeah, that's it for me. Well, thank you, Satya. That was fantastic. Uh, there's much I want to discuss of that, but we'll probably save that for the question and answer section. So now we have the Honorable Aaron Stonehouse, and whenever you're ready, go ahead and begin. Yeah, thank you, Jacob. Um, and uh, thank you, Satya, for, uh, for that rundown of uh, Australian political history. Um, I, I absolutely agree uh, that the colony of Victoria ruined everything for the rest of Australia, um, the absolute worst. Uh, in fact, an interesting point, uh, it was a, a conservative premier in Western Australia that extended the franchise to women um, back in the 19th century. And he did that because at the time in, in the colony of Western Australia, uh, there was an influx of Victorians because we had a, a gold rush at the time. And the premier at that time, a conservative, was concerned that these Victorians flooding into Western Australia would vote in a, uh, a left-wing government. So he extended the franchise to Western Australian uh, conservative women uh, to <laughs> in a in a bid to uh, to uh, to stop a political swing to the left. Um, <clears throat> it's it's interesting. I, I might talk a little bit about uh, liberalism in in uh, Australia and in Western Australia in particular, uh, and perhaps the part that um, that I play. Uh, for those who are unfamiliar, I'm a member of the Liberal Democrats, uh, the LDP, Liberal Democratic Party. We're very different to the Liberal Democrats in the United Kingdom. We're not affiliated with them in any way. Um, I think you could probably say the Liberal Democrats in the United Kingdom are, are a left of centre party. Uh, we are a, um, a classical Liberal Party. Uh, a lot of people define us as being libertarian. Uh, like Jacob, I'm not such a fan of that word. It's a clumsy word. It doesn't have a lot of meaning to people. I prefer the word classical liberal myself, or just liberal, uh, for short. Um, it, it, is, it is consistent, but every now and then we have to distinguish ourselves uh, from, uh, from the Liberal Party here in Australia. And the Liberal Party was founded on, of course, uh, liberal ideals. Robert Menzies was a great man, but I think when you look at the Liberal Party today uh, in Australia, they've strayed very far from that legacy, from that tradition. They're now a mishmash of conservatives, some liberals uh, and a bunch of sort of moderate centrists, even some folks that are quite progressive as well. Uh, and so they're kind of all over the place. It depends on what state you go to in Australia as to, to you know, how closely they stick to that tradition. Um, but, uh, but they've really, uh, I, I think they've really dropped the ball and, and lost, uh, lost that connection to that 
liberal tradition that they were founded on. Um, <clears throat> When, when we look though at, you know, sort of who, who are the keepers of liberalism in Australia today, uh, it's really hard to say. I mean, obviously I think the Liberal Democrats are, are the party that, that stands true to those ideals, you know, free markets, free minds, uh, personal liberty, limited government. Uh, that is literally what, what the Liberal Democrats are founded on and what its members of parliament currently stand for. Um, but, uh, but look, I, I always find myself much more critical of the, uh, of the left uh, the political left in Australia when it comes to being uh, the, the, the biggest abusers of liberalism. Um, and, and look, the Liberal Party is guilty of many sins. You know, there are right-wing authoritarians uh, uh, all the way through that organisation and they implement some absolutely terrible policy on a regular basis. And I think you'd see the same thing with the, uh, with the political right in America. <clears throat> all manner of authoritarians but the uh, political left in Australia really draws my eye more than anyone else uh, because of, uh, I think, how hypocritical they are. You know, they, they will uh, express views of, uh, of liberty, of liberalism, of uh, individual freedom, but only when it's convenient to them uh, and only when it aligns with their own personal lifestyle choices. Uh, for instance, uh, Western Australia recently had a debate around voluntary, uh, voluntary assisted dying, you know, euthanasia. Um, and everybody on the left came out, you know, uh, Fabians, Marxists, progressives, moderates, they all came out and they championed this idea of autonomy, of self-ownership, of personal choice. Uh, mere days after that, uh, that debate was over, uh, they were back to their usual tricks of paternalism, uh, of freedom for me, but none for thee. Uh, <clears throat> you know, and the same goes when it comes to justice as well. You'll quite often find uh, the left uh, you know, walking uh, alongside liberals when it comes to issues of criminal justice. You know, they, they're, they're real bleeding hearts when it comes to criminal justice. They don't want to see non-violent crimes uh, punished or punitive sentences. Uh, but that only extends so far as, uh, as those activities, those criminalized activities that they approve of personally, you know, drug taking or whatever other uh, deviancies that they, uh, that they happen to uh, find favor with. The uh, you know, I, I, I've sat in Parliament in Western Australia and watched as a Green MP, who's as far left as they come, argued that uh, we shouldn't label uh, animal rights protesters as terrorists and that it's very dangerous to call animal rights protesters terrorists, even if they're, you know, breaking into people's properties and, uh, and, and using intimidation tactics. And I agree with her, of course, it's a very dangerous label to throw around. Uh, a few days later, she got up and said that our anti-terrorism laws needed to be extended to cover uh, you know, right-wing trolls on message boards and uh, incels, as though incel was some kind of, you know, organized terrorist group, and that she'd like to see, uh, you know, uh, counter-terrorism laws that target Islamic uh, extremists extended to incels, um, which, I mean, uh, that would be an absolute disaster for the Liberal Democrats and our party membership, I think. So. <laughs> but, uh, you know, the, the hypocrisy here is, is just, uh, uh, it, it, is, it is glaring and it is uh, constant. Uh, they are completely full of crap. Now, of course, the, the right in Australia are just as guilty of this hypocrisy at times. Um, but, there, but there's one thing I think that redeems them uh, a, a little bit, and that is a deference to, uh, to tradition or, or, or a deference to institutions. Uh, and I think that's really important because, you know, we don't really have like a collective consciousness, of, of collective political consciousness, right? Um, most people aren't engaged in politics. You know, they're, they're, they're the centrist meme, the, the guy that just wants to grill on the weekends, right? You know, they, they don't care about politics. They have no interest in a sort of political theory debate about who holds the label liberalism and if it should be reclaimed or not. They don't care, right? They're, they're, they're not worried about it. They care if they have a job. Uh, they care if their kids go to school. They care if their community is safe. That's about it. Uh, but what 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 we do have are institutions that are built on liberal ideals, you know, the English common law, our judiciary, uh, you know, ideas of uh, you know, habeas corpus, uh, a presumption of innocence, a right to a trial by jury. In Australia and in Commonwealth countries, we have a parliamentary democracy. We have this Westminster system that has done, I think, a better job of preserving our liberties than even the American uh, Constitution and its Bill of Rights. Uh, you know, we have, uh, we have separation of, the doctrine of separation of powers, we have uh, responsible government. We have free and open elections. These are institutions that are that are critical to preserving a liberal society, more so than the idea of liberalism being planted in the brain of voters, uh, because you can't really rely on them to think that critically during elections, unfortunately. Uh, 
those institutions are incredibly important. And what I find, my observations uh, for, from being in Parliament, being involved in politics on the, on the ground level is, uh, is that those folks centre right do have a deference to those institutions. Now, they don't, under, they don't necessarily understand the ideas and the values that underpin those institutions. Uh, and that's evidenced by the fact that, you know, they're, they're happy to run roughshod over those institutions from time to time to reach certain political outcomes or, or certain policy outcomes. But there is generally a difference to those institutions uh, and, and that ensures their preservation. Uh, what I've seen is folks on the left don't have that difference at all. Uh, they're, they're as bad as the, as the, the revolutionaries in France uh, who want to tear everything down. You know, it, you look at the current political debate, it's not folks on the right who are tearing down statues. It's not folks on the right who want to erase our history or our past or, 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 or traditions or our institutions. Okay, it's the folks on the left. Um, and so, yeah, look, uh, uh, the Liberal Party in Australia, massively disappointing if you are somebody who believes in liberal values. There are a few good ones out there, of course, or a few good members of parliament in the Liberal Party. Uh, if they were good enough, you know, I wouldn't be here. The Liberal Democrats would need to exist if the Liberal Party held to its own traditions. But uh, I generally find uh, centre-right politicians in Australia uh, are, are better, if, if perhaps even by accident, uh, better at preserving liberalism due to their deference to uh, institutions and traditions. And as Satya said, you know, Australia was, real, I, I believe, absolutely founded on liberal ideals. You know, we've lost our way in a, in a, in a lot of regards. Uh, but as a country that has no, uh, you know, a, a country that has parliamentary sovereignty, where, where the parliament can write any law essentially it likes uh, and isn't bound by a constitution limiting its powers, at least not in the states, the Commonwealth is, but not the states, uh, you know, it, it, it really goes to show that we still enjoy quite a lot of freedom in this country. Uh, and it's because those liberal ideals have endured through our institutions. Um, you know, so the, most of the colonies were founded in the uh, 18th or early 19th century at a time when, uh, you know, abolitionists had just been successful uh, abolishing uh, slavery through the British Empire. Uh, you know, when, when ideas of liberalism were flourishing and at their height, uh, and that's a time when our, when our colonies were established. Uh, and so those ideas came with those colonists, they came with those immigrants. Uh, to this country, uh, and and they've endured. Uh, they're always under attack, but they've endured somewhat as a result of that. But um, <clears throat> look, I think uh, the the last point I might make is uh, you know this kind of uh, this debate about you know political theory and philosophy, uh, you know reclaiming the word liberalism. I think ultimately, in a political context, it, it's it's really unnecessary. It doesn't matter. Right, it, it, for a politician, for someone engaged in politics outside the theoretical debate, uh, it, it becomes just a question of messaging. You know, which word is in vogue? Now, look, I, I'm sympathetic to um, the points that Jacob made. You know, and, and reference to Orwell. You know, words do matter, of course, they absolutely do. But uh, ultimately, in the game of politics, it's you know, what words are popular, what what words poll well. You know, if liberalism doesn't work, then we go to classical liberalism. If libertarianism works in America, you can use it or you can't use it, but uh, it, it ultimately doesn't matter. Uh, what matters really is, is what message resonates with voters uh, as opposed to any kind of, uh, you know, uh, consistent branding across the world. I really don't think that's too important. I think most people understand that, you know, the word liberal in one country may not mean the same thing in another country. Um, and, you know, messaging changes every election cycle uh, uh, to try to tap into whatever the zeitgeist happens to be at that time. But uh, I, that's all I had to say for the moment, Jacob, but I'm looking forward to some questions and answers. No, that was fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, wow. So you're telling me that uh, politicians aren't um, receptive to Orwellian critiques? <laughs> that they <laughs> never mind anyways um we actually have a couple good questions to start off and everyone who's watching feel free to type your questions away uh, i'm going to be try to make these answers as concise as possible so we can get to as many people as possible but this is actually one for all three people so i'm going to ask us all the speakers to be as quick as possible here but from abhishek ramakrishnan um, I'm not quite sure of the gender, but they said, uh, hi, I want you to ask, I'm sorry. Hi, I want to ask every speaker over here as to whether we, 
whether we can come up with a mutually agreed upon definition of what liberalism means in the West, because changing definitions of it will create more confusion and prove to be counterproductive in terms of reclaiming it by uniting everyone who believes in it based on one definition as opposed to multiple definitions. I agree, so I actually thought about this a little bit. Uh, as I said earlier, I don't think conservatism is on the same spectrum as liberalism. I think they're actually quite different spectrums. Conservatism is with progressivism and liberalism is on the spectrum of socialism. So I would just simply define uh, liberalism as anti-socialism. And that does not necessarily mean anti-left. It means anti-socialist and socialist attacks are very often coming from the right. I'm not as familiar with Australian politics, but recently I wrote a piece in the United States about Chuck Grassley, a Republican, who, and the Republicans are on the right. He actually introduced a healthcare bill where he wanted to give the Secretary of Health and Human Services the full ability to price set and to tell pharmaceutical companies what they can charge. That is literally the most socialistic thing I've ever heard in my life. It's absolutely ridiculous. So I would, I would when, when we're talking about the opposite of socialism, don't confuse that with the opposite of leftism. It's really the opposite of bureaucrats and elected officials having absolute command control over the economy and other aspects of our life. Yeah, cool. cool. Um, so I'll, I'll add to that a little bit. So firstly, I think Jacob is spot on to say anti-socialism, but I think to be a little more specific, you know, there's certain very key tenets that you have to accept as an axiom for any proper liberal philosophy. The first is, you know, a belief in certain inalienable rights that must be preserved no matter how tempting it is to override them. You know, the right to a fair, of a fair trial, due process, uh, freedom of expression, freedom of belief, freedom of worship, and, and so on. Uh, the right to not be aggressed against, uh, except for in a situation of self-defense or in situations involving criminal punishment for, you know, violent defenses and so on. Um, and a minimal role for the state, that is to maintain uh, order and, you know, within reason uh, and to provide for the national defense uh, and to otherwise only be there to take care of those individuals who cannot by their own volition take care of themselves. So it would differ from, you know, uh, you know, anarchism, for example, in the idea that liberalism, I think, does accept that a state can exist. You know, all the early liberal thinkers, uh, none of them said the state should not exist. They were simply talking about what the proper role for the state should be. Now you can take that further and say abolish the state completely and that's a completely fine position to have, uh, but liberalism itself is a broader spectrum uh, than that. Um, and I, I would say that, um, uh, you know, we have to run any policy that claims to be a liberal policy against as a litmus test. Because a number of policies that purport to be liberal, such as having a massively expanded welfare state, they would need to fail this test because they are examples of government overreach. They are examples of government cronyism. Uh, and if we have this laid down in the paper, then we at least have a position from which we can be like, you know, this is not liberal. And the last point that I want to make is I actually disagree with Jacob a little bit on the idea that conservatism is opposed to liberalism. I think conservatism is probably one of the most misunderstood philosophies because conservatism is about incremental change and respect for enduring institutions. So what that means is if you live in a society that has been completely unlike the one we currently live in, and it's been that way for generations and decades, conservatism would focus on preserving the dominant order within that society because it's proven itself and it's lasted that long. So in our society, to be a conservative is, to a significant degree, to be a liberal. And we have some so-called conservatives who want to undo the enlightenment and go back to a time before that. You know, paleoconservatives, which I think is a good term because it implies a difference from conservatives. Um, but for the most part, conservatism doesn't necessarily oppose with liberalism is the point that I want to make. Well, I don't think I said that. Didn't I say that liberalism and uh, conservatism aren't on the same spectrum? What I said was opposing to uh, conservatism was progressivism. Okay, uh, okay. I, I, when you said not on the same spectrum, I thought I, I thought it implied that they don't really overlap. Uh, what I mean Sorry. is they can slightly like, overlap. Yeah. Like you, okay, I, I, I got what you mean. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I completely agree with that sentiment. I don't think they're really, you can be both liberal and conservative, and I think it actually completely depends on the status quo of where you live. Like in the United States, we have much freedom in this country. Um, and I think conservatives, 
um, enjoy it and they understand how rare that is. And that's why they're quite resistant to massive changes to the political system because they know our liberties might be at risk if we make massive change. I think that we have a really good question from Harriet that applies right to this, um, from Harriet Smith. What about us conservatives? They're not mutually exclusive. My heart says liberalism, my head says conservatism. Is there somewhere in between? Um, and I think, could you speak um, to personal responsibility and um, how that ties in with liberalism and how conservatism and liberalism can overlap? Um, and if it is the rational thing to be uh, liberal, in your head as well as not just your heart. Yeah, Emily, um, I, I might just talk about my own personal view, which is that I have very conservative um, sensibilities. Uh, you know, my own view of the world is uh, is very much informed by my own, um, you know, my own personal values and my own my own Christian beliefs. Uh, I I just draw the line at wanting to compel other people to live their life the way that I that I want to live my own, right? And so. Uh, in that sense, I, I suppose I have a, a perhaps a conservative heart, but a liberal head. Uh, you know, it's a, uh, uh, there is a there is a good way to live life and there is a, a good way to order society, um, but it is a bad idea to use the coercive power of the state to enforce that on anybody else. And there are terrible unintended consequences when you try to do that. Uh, and so I think that allows, uh, and, and that view I think is one that's held by a lot of folks who are center right in Australia, um, and it allows, uh, it allows those folks to be perhaps fellow travelers with conservatives to a certain extent. Um, uh, but in terms of, uh, in, in terms of um, uh, I suppose, where the left sits on that, uh, you know, we can, find, we can find agreement with the left in, in so far as uh, they agree with certain policy outcomes, but I've found less so of a consistent um, a consistent application of liberal principles in the left when it comes to my interaction with people in parliament. Um, like I said uh, earlier, it, there is uh, there is a liberalism is used as a as a tool in rhetoric for that. You know, it's used as a debate. Uh, it's not something that I actually believe in uh, because they're not. They, uh, my observation is that their worldview and their and their values are not built on the sovereignty or the uh, or the uh, or any kind of respect for the individual as, as their own person as their own actor um it's very much more a uh, collected uh, collectivist uh, mindset and you do get collectivists on the right as well but um but i find they're more on the fringes rather than uh rather than making up a majority of folks who are center right um uh <clears throat> so yeah I, I i find generally uh those who have liberal sensibilities in australia uh are, are, are finding more common ground with folks who are sort of in that center right kind of space um and so you know it seems to coalesce around the liberal party um more than anything uh and the, and the lib dems and some other minor parties along the way um if i could, if I could add to that so um uh, ronald reagan uh who you know took the guns away from uh black people in california and who you know uh over helped to overthrow a bunch of latin american countries um he once said that libertarianism is at the heart of conservatism and I think it's a great quote, but I actually think it's the exact opposite. I think conservatism is at the heart of libertarianism. Because uh, how do you run a stable and successful society if the government is going to have a minimal role? And the answer is you need to have a certain set of values that you promote not using the state apparatus, apparatus not using state coercion or force or indoctrination, but promoting these values because you believe in these values and they've stood the test of time. And they've given you a recipe to raise a family, a stable environment where a child can grow up and, you know, uh, learn and become resilient and be surrounded by support networks, whether that's their family or it's their church or, it's, you know, civil society group, if the parents aren't religious. But all of those great, lovely conservative principles for how to live your life. I mean, the one of the good things I think of about conservatism is it actually tells you this is a better way to live your life. Whereas liberalism says, hey, it's up to you. Go out and figure it out. So I think the two of those are actually not incompatible at all. In fact, the conservative worldview fits in so neatly with this idea that uh, you know uh, we should go out there and find our own path. Because if conservatives really do have the best answer, really do have the best path, then it's their ideas that will win out in the end. And one of the things that I tell my really conservative friends who you know say they don't like liberalism when we banter and when we have drinks at the pub, is I tell them, listen, all those so-called liberals you complain about, you know, the people 
uh, who are stereotypically having purple hair and unshaven armpits and tearing down statues and bashing the fash, so to speak, um, they're not going to have children. Most of them are not going to have families, not going to have children. You know, they're, you know, look, I've got nothing against, you know, taking contraceptives, um, but they're not, you know, that's not something they want for themselves. And that's awesome. That's great. So what happens then? Who produces and propagates the next generation? I'll tell you who. It's the people who have stable, successful families and who have the best environment and who want to have children in that environment. Um, and that's why I think ultimately uh, those good ideas that conservatives see as being eliminated by liberalism, they're going to endure and they're going to survive. And honestly, it's going to be because of liberalism, because what stops the state from interfering with those ideas and breaking them up? It's liberal thinking. I think that's a great point. Someone was actually asking specifically about conservatarianism, and I think you addressed that, that question very well. Uh, yeah, I think that the conservatarians are the ones who are pragmatic about conservatism and are the ones who are not compelling people to live their way, which is the most sustainable way for us all to live together. So I should probably address the elephant that's not in the room. Uh, my father wanted to go elephant hunting, but I told him that elephants are too smart to shoot. So we do not have an elephant to put in the background, but we do have a lion um, and the lion's quite beautiful. And we actually have about 50 other uh, mounted animals in the house. I don't know if I have enough time to walk around with the laptop, but there's actually a 10 foot bear right there. There's a moose, there's an elk, uh, can uh, cantaloupe, uh, not cantaloupe, antelope. Yeah, I just ate cantaloupe this morning, I got confused. Um, but yeah, uh, so what was I gonna say? Back to your point on guns, someone actually asked, oh, it was the right that took the guns away? Absolutely. It did start with Lyndon B. Johnson in the six, within the 60s with the Gun Control Act, which basically banned uh, fully automatic rifles in the United States. You could still buy them, but they basically just cut off the supply of manufacturing for civilians to own legally. So there's just so few of them that you can't get them now. But yeah, Reagan actually, uh, after the patrols with the Black Panthers, he lobbied to get rid of guns. Um, got, I'm sorry, got lobbied to get rid of open carry in California. And then after he was president, he actually lobbied and basically wrote the machine gun, I'm sorry, the assault weapons ban of the 90s that uh, Clinton signed. Clinton didn't actually have much to do with that bill. He just signed it when it came to his desk. It was really Reagan lobbying everyone to do it. And the funny thing about it is like all these Republicans who the National Rifle Association supports, they all basically supported that Reagan led bill and they all have a rating, all, all have a ratings from the National Rifle Association. And one of the people who was opposing such gun control efforts at the moment was uh, Bernie Sanders. Um, and he has a, basically an F from the NRA. So just the consistency of these political organizations um, trying to describe the gun rights of people or the gun right advocacy of our politicians are absolutely absurd. But yeah, did you see any other questions, Emily, that we should get to? Um, we, yeah, well, I have both have one last question. Um, and I'll be my question, actually, sorry. Um, so a lot of times we hear in the libertarian movement, like this is the real libertarian, this is the not li real liber libertarian. And somebody else asked in the group, um, how do we reclaim the libertarian party? Do you think that these kinds of decisions about like what's real libertarianism and these disputes about um, like the very specifics are that helpful to the libertarian party and reclaiming the libertarian party from say conservatism or um, leftism? Well, I think if we're discussing the Libertarian Party in the United States, I think the only way to reclaim the Libertarian Party in any sort of successful fashion would be to invite people on the left. My idea is to basically rename it the Liberal Party. Um, I, I'm not saying that's necessary, but I think that would actually be a great signal to everybody who is on the left who is actually quite resistant to joining because without people on the left, we're not going to go anywhere. There's not enough people on the right who have liberal ideologies for it to move forward. We need help from people on the other side of the aisle and both of us, both sides are gonna have to make concessions in order to move forward. But yeah, I mean, this, the, that, that entire idea is actually what predicated this entire idea to have this talk. So thank you so much for having us. Thank you, it's very useful. And so what we're gonna do, um, I'm gonna shut off my camera and I'm going to move us into a kind of a discussion where everyone is allowed to um, contrib contribute uh, to the conversation at will. Um, and you're welcome to stay on. Speakers can stay on. It'll be for 30 minutes. Or you can leave. Um, it's flexible. So 
you're welcome to continue this conversation or not. Um, and I'm gonna open up the floor so that anyone can unmute themselves and talk. But this is the official conclusion of the conversation. Thank you so much, guys. This was a really great discussion. And um, I think it was very, it clarified a lot of things, I think for me and for the audience. So thank you. No problem. <laughs> yeah, you know anyone dreams? who wants to un unmute yourselves, you guys can talk. Um, there's a question that was directed at me personally. Um, I might start by answering that. So, uh, hi, Satyajit. When you, what you said about the next generation being conservative because they'll be born to conservative parents may not come true if the so-called liberals are successful in changing the culture of the West in terms of converting the youth into believing that relationships don't matter and therefore marriage is inherently patriarchal. Could you answer this? Look, that sort of concern is, in my opinion, completely misplaced. And I think there's a historical precedent for this. You should look at some of the uh, posters they were putting up back when the suffragette movement of the early, of the early 1900s was, was going on. It was saying, you know, feminists will make you, will make women leave their husbands and smoke marijuana and, you know, all this absurd crap that at the time, probably to some people, seemed like, oh my, my God, they seem to be pushing for that sort of stuff. They're promoting these really, you know, radical values and who knows what will happen next. And I think the evidence that anyone except for a small radical fringe of people who probably weren't going to have children anyway, sometimes because they can't attract partners, um, are the kinds of people who actually believe those really extreme ideas that families should be completely abolished or that relationships are inherently patriarchal. Most ordinary people don't believe that. And what's interesting is if you talk to even actual feminist academics at universities, I mean, yes, there's some very loud ones who believe that sort of crap, in my opinion. Um, but most of them would not go that far. That's not what they actually believe in. I mean, they have some radical ideas, but that sort of stuff, that's really fringe stuff. So I don't think there's any actual danger of that catching on or gaining currency. You know, relationships, uh, you know, having a man, woman, and raising children is still the norm. We've heard about things like polyamory, where people are in love with multiple people. And that's, you know, that seems to work for a bunch of people. But I think the research on that and whether that has any long-term impact on family structures uh, won't come out for a long time. And I would suspect that, you know, by the time it comes out, it'll turn out that that stuff hasn't actually caught on with too many people who end up having children. Um, at the end of the day, you have to ask yourself, which group in society actually really wants to have children and isn't just like, oh, I might have a kid someday. And the answer is, it's people who want to settle down and form families with a partner. Um, so I don't think it's something to necessarily worry about. And at the end of the day, these are the people who, even if I'm wrong, are on average going to have more children. And, um, oh yeah, and you also have immigration and most immigrants on average tend to be more conservative in terms of social values than the average local person. So, you know, immigration gets a bad rap, but a lot of the people leading these movements radically change the culture. I'm telling you, they're not immigrants. They're, they're whiter than Matthew Perry from Friends. I kind of have a question for you and for Aaron off the back of that, Sacha. Um, about conservatism and um, the tie-in of religion with the conservatism. Do you think that as like, particularly religions that like to convert people to their religion, so that, yeah. Do you think that as they have children and that becomes more predominant, that they're going to try to convert society to their values that would not be liberal, but would be more conservative values and more authoritarian? Is that a concern? I, I, don't, I don't share that concern. I mean, it, you know, about 20 years ago, the, um, the conservative Christian right were, were absolute tyrants, right? You know, they were banning video games, banning violent movies, banning rap music. I think, I think Congress held a, held a few inquiries or a few hearings into, you know, rap albums, right? Um, I, think, uh, I think a lot of conservative uh, Christians, uh, at least, have, uh, have started to realize uh, that they can be on the receiving end of, a, of an authoritarian government. For a very long time, they were in power and they enjoyed all the benefits of that, of that powerful government. Now they're starting to realize that it's come back to bite them. And uh, my observation is, is that a lot of, uh, at least a lot of Christian lobby groups uh, are starting to talk about liberalism again. They're starting to find uh, their, their liberal values once more. Um, and so they're, they're becoming new champions of free speech uh, and of freedom of association. 
uh, and they have a, a, a very strong rejection of sort of quasi-Marxist uh, views of society. Uh, and uh, so I don't think we really have too much to fear from these groups. Of course, we need to be careful that, you know, if there's a resurgence in, you know, religious um, conservatism that that they don't, you know, end up gaining back the levers of power and using them to uh, protect themselves and persecute others, uh, as they may have done in the past. But I think, I think for the immediate term, there's not really any risk there. Um, and and I've found uh, they are they are generally more receptive to ideas of of liberty. I think it's I think it's absolutely true that our current sensibilities of liberalism came out of uh, a sort of Judeo Christian tradition of morality. You know, the abolitionists were. Uh, were, were, were very religious people and they made religious arguments for the abolition of slavery um, and, and a lot of social so-called social justice movements in the past have been driven by uh, by people with very strong religious beliefs and, and on the basis of those religious beliefs so I think I think they can be educated uh, and, and sort of brought into the fold of liberalism um, as long as we know how to speak their language yeah and uh, yeah some of the most uh, some of the biggest piss tanks that I know who can really take their drink are religious people because they accept that vice is a part of the human condition and that there are certain conditions where vice is permitted and understood within its proper context and order. Um, and, and look, um, I think that a little bit too much emphasis is placed on the idea of indoctrination. And often the, some of the biggest people who use the indoctrination excuse are people on the left because what they actually mean is like, what they actually mean is, well, we can't indoctrinate them in our ideas. Um, Whereas what I find is when someone raises their child in a Christian household, I mean, yes, there's some very ultra conservative Christian households that are authoritarian, but there's so many people out there who are raised in these sorts of strict households who grow up to not be like that. And there's similarly so many people who go through public school uh, who are exposed to, you know, an argument or a, a slant in the teaching sometimes that leans pro teachers union, for example. I know I was when I was in public school. And it turn out completely different because at the end of the day, kids are going to be exposed to a range of influences. And when they become independent adults, they're going to make up their own mind. Uh, so I think the whole indoctrination idea uh, that makes people more authoritarian, I mean, yes, of course, it's, it's going to happen. There are going to be pockets where that perpetuates itself. But I don't see that as really um, being as big a threat as it's put out to be. And in terms of empirical evidence for this, uh, they did, they've done studies on the Catholic school system, uh, or I, I'm not sure if just Catholic or Christian in general, but... Uh, in these schools, only 20% of kids come out of that system identifying as being Catholic or being Christian. So clearly, you know, even their attempts to introduce and nurture children within the faith, um, they tend to not be successful on average for whatever reason. Um, so I, I wouldn't put that point too highly. And that's why Catholics are supposed to have as many kids as possible. Um, one thing to bring up with this conversation, though, about the religion, uh, I, I just read today that the Catholic Church may have received up to $3.5 billion from the federal government for because of the coronavirus. And the AP is reporting on how the Catholic Church is basically using much of this money to, uh, to revitalize some of the dioceses that have gone bankrupt because of child abuse um, allegations and convictions, which I think is quite deplorable, even though I've been going to Catholic Church and, and in general, very supportive of the organization. But yeah, I mean, is there any sort of, I, mean, I think it's quite obvious that churches and nonprofit organizations have the same incentives to be crony bastards, just like everybody else. And uh, true liberalism is going to be mindful of this and will resist, um, even if it happens to be an organization that we individually support. Now, I, I will say that we should probably look into what the AP said a little bit more because the AP and the news in general are quite biased and like to get the Catholic Church whenever they can. But it, if it is true that they receive that sort of money, it is quite easy for their accountants to switch the money around to basically say, oh yeah, these funds were going towards lost wages, which means that these uh, loans don't need to be repaid. And if you just mix your money around a little bit, you might be able to use it to squelch some of the multi-million, multi-billion dollar lawsuits that are coming against the Catholic Church for the child abuse allegations. So just, just one thing I wanted to throw out there. Um, 
is there any, is there anything else that anyone wanted to bring up? Because I had something. If there's not a specific question, I think uh, we six that he wants to ask something on the mic, but uh, I don't think he realized that he can unmute himself. Like I've just unmute. Okay. Well, keep trying to unmute yourself, and if you can't figure it out, I'll just put it in the question. Just put it in the chat, and we'll read he's, it off he's, here. He's unmuted himself. Oh, hi, Satyajit. Can you hear me? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, we. Can. Yeah, so uh, uh, I hope you're right with whatever you have said. Uh, I just wanted to counter that by saying that, uh, you know, ideas like classical liberalism and uh, conservatism, the validity and the sustenance of those ideas depend on the people who buy into those ideas, right? And yeah. uh, that is dependent on, uh, you know, the platforms that allow those ideas to flourish. Now, if we look at the way institutions are silencing and canceling people who believe in those ideas, and are only allowing you know certain ideas to flourish based on their uh, political agenda or their narrative. Do you really think these ideas can flourish or sustain themselves in the future? Because not many of our future generations would be exposed to those ideas as much as we are being exposed to, you know, through uh, you know these platforms like uh, the Liberty Forum, etc. So, what do you have? What is your take on that? Sure. Um, so, I think the, the first point to make is that. Uh, the way social change is portrayed in the media is often to direct the camera at, where, at the biggest extremes. So, you know, you, you have thousands of universities, but the university that you'll hear about in the news is the one where one academic made a tweet saying that white people shouldn't exist. And that becomes a news story. And it turns out, oh, Cambridge is letting her keep her job. And, you know, Cambridge is one of the most influential schools in the world. Um, so, you know, I, I get that it can feel that way. It can feel like as if these ideas are being torn down, ripped apart, never to be restored again. But the other point to make is that even if there is some of that happening, even if that is a really serious thing that we're going to suffer from, there's always a reactionary backlash. There's always, um, you know, the fact that the average person, we, you know, we call them the quiet Australian in, in Australia. Um, they make their voice heard of the ballot box. They make the, their voice heard around the dinner table, even if, they don't feel comfortable saying anything in the corporate boardroom, even if they don't feel comfortable saying stuff out loud at the university campus. And to be honest with you, uh, I still you know, interact with quite a lot of people who are at Australian universities. Uh, and the kind of debates and discussions they continue to have on campus are just as robust as the way they used to be before. I mean, yeah, there's certain things that you probably can't get away with that you could 10 years ago, you know, making certain jokes, for example. Um, but, you know, the level of discussion that's going on is quite significant. And I'm, I'm even seeing potentially a rise in the number of, you know, young people identifying themselves, not necessarily as liberal, although I think there's a bit of that too, but as identifying themselves as being conservative. Uh, and I think that's a reaction to the phenomena that kids are being exposed to as they're growing up. Uh, my generation was exposed to conservative people trying to shut down Grand Theft Auto, trying to cancel Marilyn Manson and Eminem for offensive lyrics. Uh, and as a result, many of people of my millennial generation grew up to be quite liberal and to be skeptical of conservatism. I now see the exact opposite phenomena taking place because the censorship is now being driven by people calling themselves liberal. Um, so I would say, you know, don't write off society just yet. I believe the ideas that we want to nurture are going to have a bigger resurgence as the years go on. You, you make an excellent point, uh, Satya. In Australia, we have this sort of protest vote and we've got this proliferation of minor or micro parties uh, driven by a protest vote. A, a, lot of, uh, a lot of politicians use that word, you know, the, um, the quiet Australians or it's what was it? Nixon, I think, uh, used the word um, silent majority or coined the phrase, I think. Um, and, and sometimes people abuse that word to try to claim a larger mandate than they really have. Uh, but I think it's I think it's a, a real phenomenon in that yeah as people continue to be shouted down and deplatformed and cancelled on social media, um, a, a lot of that conversation is no longer expressed in the public forum. Uh, a, a lot of those uh, controversial ideas or perhaps even libertarian or liberal ideas or conservative ideas are no longer discussed in a public forum, and so people only the, the only recourse folks have to express their views and their political. Uh, their political um, uh, sensibilities is through the ballot box. Um, and that's where you see, you know, polling becomes incredibly unreliable. You know, you see the election of, uh, the, the surprise election of uh, Trump, or as a surprise to some people at least. Uh, you saw that in the last federal election here in Australia, which might have come as a surprise to some people too. Um, and, and I actually think it's really, really unhealthy uh, for a society 
to remove the ability for people to debate ideas in, in public forums in, out in the open and to instead leave them with the only option left, which is exercising their, uh, you know, expressing their views through a ballot box. You know, I think, uh, I think politics uh, should be the last resort. You know, if people can debate ideas and find solutions to problems uh, through healthy and robust debate, that, that's much better for a society rather than having one side of politics, uh, you know, have to guard their speech and be quiet um, and only exercise their views uh, uh, during an election. Um, but I think uh, Satch is also right, though, that a lot of these conversations still take place. It's just people have to be a little more careful about how they express themselves. Um, and they perhaps don't express their views out in the open where it's within view of their employer or, or in view of other, uh, you know, agitators, you know, sleeping giants, things like that. Um, but, um, uh, you know, there's a view, uh, I think in the chat, you know, some folks talked about, um, you know, folks on the right being collectivist, you know, uh, racists and sort of, you know, ethno-nationalist type folks that, that occupy certain corners of, uh, of politics. Um, I think they're actually really quite in the minority in Australia. You know, we, we think that some of these groups are bigger than they are because they make a lot of noise and they get a lot of media attention. You know, if you watch the news in Australia, you would think that the folks that want to tear down statues uh, make up quite a, size, uh, quite, quite a large group of people. They don't, uh, they really don't. There's a few thousand perhaps in Western Australia, uh, a few thousand more across the entire country. They're a tiny minority, they're just very, very loud. And they would like to resort to violence to get their way rather than, uh, rather than through elections and a democratic process because they don't have the numbers to, to force their will on other people through, uh, through, through the political system. They have to resort to violence and to megaphones and protests and nuisances. But um, the point I was gonna make, uh, you know, that racist fringe, I really think is quite small in Australia. And you know, we had uh, at the last federal election, uh, we had an overt racist running. Uh, you know, this is a guy who took Pauline Hanson's shtick uh, and he dialed it up to 11. You know, he was straight boomer posting on Facebook, you know, poorly compressed JPEG memes about, you know, if you don't like it, leave, uh, you know, or send people back to where they came from. All it, horrible racist stuff, overtly racist. He was intentionally tapping into that vote. Uh, you know, he made a reference to the final solution in his inaugural speech, uh, for crying out loud. This guy went as, as hard as he could for the racist vote and he lost. He was not successful. He lost. Okay, there, there are not enough racists across the country to sustain this kind of overt racist politician. Now, we do have, you know, Pauline Hanson, who's very problematic in her own way, but I think she's not tapping into necessarily overtly racist views, but more so that protest vote. Those people who, uh, who reject a sort of political correctness, uh, who, you know, who, uh, you know, don't like what they see when people tear down statues uh, or when they attack the institutions that they like or that they're used to or the traditions that they like and they're used to. So, um, so yeah, uh, um, I've thrown out a few ideas there, but yeah, I, I, I think these sort of fringe uh, extremists really are small. Uh, they're, they're pumped up by the media. Most people are pretty sensible occupy a sort of the center of politics, I think. There's, there's definitely people who vote One Nation who are not racist, indeed, I agree. They're, they're just, Probably um, they're just more a protest vote. Yeah, exactly. I, I, know, I know people from the outer suburbs of Melbourne and stuff, they're just dis disillusioned coalition voters who think the coalition's not quite standing up for in some areas for what they want. And they're, they're, they think that Pauline Hanson's talking their language a bit more and they vote for it. Very interesting. All right, any more questions? There was something I kind of want to elaborate on if there's nothing else that's going to pop up. Yeah, um, sure. One thing I was thinking about was how I've been thinking about the left a lot and how laws originally put in place by the left have actually caused the racial disparities and the inequalities that they are often complaining about now. Um, much of the racial disparity that exists in the, our criminal justice system in the United States. I mean, for all, actually, I think we have the highest per capita uh, crim, uh, pr prison rate in the world, even if you include like non-developed countries. I know among developed nations, we are magnitudes above everybody else. But I, I mean, who started the war on drugs? It was Woodrow Wilson. It was Woodrow Wilson. He he banned opium, all opium extracts that include heroin and all sorts of opioids and cocaine from recreational consumption. 
and he lobbied the rest of the world to join him. And that's why we have a giant worldwide drug war now. And then about 50 years later, you have Lyndon B. Johnson coming in with the gun control acts. And through that, we basically have these gun laws mixed with these uh, drug control laws, which were originally instituted by progressives that were weaponized against people of color. And it's, I just find it incredibly ironic that these laws that, that basically were birthed by the left and caused all the disparities that the left are, is now complaining about, how, how that happens to be true. Now, you can argue that Nixon put the infrastructure in place to really carry out the war on drugs, and then Reagan, after him, put in mandatory minimums. So I don't want to say that the right is innocent by any means in this. But like the original ideas seem to be progressive, but they caused incredibly regressive effects in our criminal justice system that I don't think are keeping us safer. Just something, just some food for thought there. I think you see the same and it's just consequences with welfare programs. Yeah, yeah, like they just like this I the, like the false idea of liberalism like keeps itself alive with like terrible ideas causing problems that it has to come in and fix again, which will cause future problems that'll have to come in and fix again. It's just like a Wonderful. vicious cycle of seeing. Yeah. So um, battery operated battery change and then only changes its own batteries. Yes. Yes. Very very interesting. Um, the the for the for profit prisons um, impact this and a willingness to to have crimes that imprison people as the sentence? Well, for-profit prisons are relatively new in the United States. Like the, the over-incarceration issue was a, a problem before for-profit prisons. Um, ideally, like I, I understand why for-profit prisons get a bad rap. And I think if they are designed inappropriately, they, they could obviously lead to cronyism that would increase the incentive for incarceration. But um, I actually have a family member who's in prison and he's in prison in Florida at the moment and he's gonna be in prison for the rest of his life. And I was there visiting him and I, I said, where's the air conditioning? He's like, oh, we don't have air conditioning. And I'm like, wait, this is Florida. Like you guys could die. And he's like, yeah, people do die. And then I did some research and I found out that the only prisons in Florida that have air conditioning are the for-profit prisons, which is incredibly interesting, right? Um, I, maybe that's because they're newer, but the, the whole idea of for-profit versus non-profit, there's always incentives that are gonna be guiding each institution, right? And even if you're a pro, either, either a government-ran institution or a quote, non-profit prison, it, it really just depends on the incentives put in place. And if the government designed a system of compensation for for-profit prisons that did not put the funding based on maximizing the number of people coming into the prison, maybe they actually just give the prison a set amount of money no matter how many prisoners they have, and they can take all the rest home. And if they have that sort of incentive, then they actually have an incentive to have the least amount of prisoners as possible. So I think it's actually much more of an issue of designing the compensation for any of the actors who are carrying out the prisons versus the actual financial structure of the prisons, if that makes any sense. So, so Jacob, in, uh, in Australia, we obviously don't have for-profit prisons, but we do have the government uh, award contracts to security providers to provide the services for prisons to provide the guards, things like that. So it's awarded on a contract basis with a tender and whoever tenders, you know, the, the, the best value for money, uh, uh, tender gets that contract and then they provide the services of the prison. So you remove uh, a lot of the incentive uh, for, um, for, the, for the private prison service to lobby for more incarceration um, uh, while still having the benefits of, uh, you know, the efficiency of a privately run business um, providing those services for government. Although uh, the outcome seems to be not that great, there are still a, a, a lot of problems, a lot of complaints about the private, um, the private companies that provide services for prisons in Australia. At least in Australia, that's been the case. Uh, Serco is one of the providers which has come under a lot of uh, a lot of flack um, for how they operate. Um, but it seems to me, I've always I've always thought it seems like something that 
uh, is not worth the risk, personally. I don't know. It, it seems that uh, the, the, the risk of nuisance, the risk of uh, perverse incentives um, is so great when it comes to uh, uh, take, you know, looking after somebody and taking away their rights and, and making sure that they are safe and looked after, at least, while still, you know, remaining in prison, uh, you know, as a way to protect society, but also as a way to punish them for their crimes. Um, seems like one of those things that we probably want an impartial government to do in the same way that we wouldn't want a for-profit uh, justice, you know, we wouldn't want for-profit courts, surely, because then uh, the risk of, you know, perverse incentives, um, uh, you know, uh, influencing the outcome of a, of a court's decisions would be too great. Um, but I don't know, that, that's, that's one of those things where I think I draw the line. I, I, courts, police prisons uh, seem like things that, you know, everybody should pay for, uh, for the benefit of everybody and should be impartial and protected from the incentives of profit. If it's yeah. costing us, it de-incentivizes usage of these things as much as possible. Yeah, so I think it all comes deep. I, this, is, this isn't my expertise field, so I'm really speaking as an outsider. Um, so if I'm provided, uh, so my entire opinion on this is completely empirically based. And whenever I'm provided with new evidence, I would adjust it immediately because I really don't care which system is better. I just want to know which system is better, if that makes any sense. And yeah, I, I think the idea that for profit with, within services that we expect the state to run, the idea that profit could corrupt them and putting those incentives in place could cause corruption, that, 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 that's completely true. I mean, I, I'm sure there are parts of our government that we really wouldn't the, want the profit incentive to be there. With prisons, I'm not quite sure if that's true. I think, again, it really just comes to, down to how they're financed and what sort of agreements uh, but what sort of agreements you make with the prison in order for them to be compensated. And I think having this sort of system, like a for-profit system where you actually incentivize them to have less prisoners might be better than um, a system where you have a completely unionized government ran system that might have the exact same profit motive incentives and same, you know, work for power that a for-profit company would have. You know, all these government programs that we put in place, do they ever get smaller? They absolutely never get smaller. They're always trying to expand. And the idea that prisons and prison uh, unions aren't gonna be uh, subject to this type of devious incentive is ridiculous. Maybe they're less, maybe, maybe they're more resistant than a for-profit corporation. And if the empirical evidence comes out and shows that that's true, I'll concede to that immediately. But I think the idea of experimenting with for-profit prisons and trying to figure out ways to incentivize them to have less prisoners is at least something worth trying. And if it shows not to be uh, successful in the data, uh, then we need to get rid of them. And I'm very sorry for experimenting with prisoners' lives while we do this. But I guess that's what we're always doing, right? More design policy, it's so dismal. All right. Um... Well, it's almost 12.30 um, it. in, in DC. Uh, thanks everybody for your questions. Thanks everyone for jumping on. Um, I know I'm not actually the moderator, but I'm kind of calling an end to this right now, <laughs> unless anyone else wants to go on. Um, the moderator's yeah. not here, I'll shield for the party. Come back at 4 p.m. for nuclear power with the Liberal Democrats. <laughs> Woo, nuclear, fuck yeah. Hey, you should talk right. on that pilot. panel, Satya. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Uh, I still need to write a reply to that fucking Jody guy. Um, <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, I have a day job, right? That sucks. But yeah. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll get to that. I'll do that. Cool. Well, thank you, everyone, for joining. And have an excellent day and night, people in DC. Adios. Adios. See ya.